Welcome to the Genesee Country Church. My name is Nathan Schmidt. I'm a deacon at the church and a member of the preaching staff. Today we're going to look at an exciting passage in Matthew chapter 12. In fact, it's kind of a long passage. We're going to be looking at verses 15 through 42. Now your Bible might have a number of different headings for this section, kind of like there are a whole bunch of disparate pieces put together, uh, like you might find in the Proverbs. Uh, my Bible has headings that say, God's chosen spirit, or sorry, God's chosen servant, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the tree is known by its fruit, and the sign of Jonah. But it's not separate stories that we're going to be looking at. It's, this entire passage has a central theme to it, and we're going to go f through that in kind of rapid fire, but when we get to the end, we'll find that Jesus is driving at a central theme, and he has an important question for us when we get to the end. So let's start with uh, Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 through 17, where it says, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. So, we learn that Jesus withdrew, and, and where did he withdraw from? Earlier in the uh, 12th chapter of Matthew, we learned that he was in the synagogue. He's kind of having a discussion there with people, and that he then withdrew or, or moved out of there, probably to a more remote place where he could have some privacy. He withdrew from them in verse 14, and I didn't read that, but just before our passage, we learned that he withdrew from the Pharisees. He was trying to get away from them too. And when he did, lots of people followed him though. And they were sick, and they were diseased, and they were hurt. And Jesus, filled with compassion, he healed them all. All of them. And he told the people, interestingly, not to make him known. In other words, not to tell the Pharisees that he had been healing them, because that would just uh, make the situation with them worse. And not to tell the Pharisees where he would gone. Uh, we see that in verse 16. Unfortunately, uh, that's not quite how it ends up, and the Pharisees do follow him, and that's really the heart of our discussion today, a discussion that Jesus has with the Pharisees. There's a little bit of an interlude here, um, where the next verses, verses uh, 18 through 21, where Matthew connects this section of, of, of his telling the story of Jesus with Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 3. Now let me read that to you and we'll go through it. It says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. It's a fascinating passage out of Isaiah. And frankly, it's clearly a messianic pa passage. It talks about Jesus in there. But before we get to that, who is really doing the speaking here? Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved. That's God the Father talking, the first member of the Trinity, talking about being pleased in Jesus. We saw that when... when uh, God spoke out of the heavens when the dove came to rest on Jesus at his baptism. We see it again here in this passage written hundreds of years before Jesus. It says, I will put my spirit upon him. And don't miss the capital S there. That capital S, spirit, is God's Holy Spirit, the second member of the Trinity. He will put his spirit upon him. That's going to be important for later on. That's an important part of what Jesus argues with the Pharisees about. And then it talks about Jesus, what he's going to do, the work of Jesus. It says that he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Interesting, the Gentiles in this passage? Jesus is right here dealing with the Jews, and yet Matthew uses this passage to connect us with it as well. It says that Jesus will not quarrel or cry aloud. He's not coming here to be confrontational. He's not coming here to make arguments. Nor will anyone hear his voice in, this, in the streets. He's not coming here to start a riot. It says, a bruised reed he will not break. Now, a reed got used for lots of different things 
in Israel at the time. You know, consider it kind of a straw. They would make a, a flute out of it and other things. But when it got soft or partially broken, they would throw it out and they would start with a new one. A smoldering wick, think of a candle that is burned all the way down to the end. It's not worth anything at that point. You would throw it out and start over. But it says Jesus isn't going to throw those things out. They're really metaphors for people, imperfect people like you and I. Jesus doesn't throw us out, right? He instead redeems us. What a picture. And he brings justice to victory, and in his name will the Gentiles hope. That's the work of Jesus. In, in fact, I, I think of a passage in John chapter 18, this is 37 through 38, where Pilate asks him a question. Now, Pilate was his judge just before he was crucified, and Pilate sent him to be crucified. But Pilate says to him in verse 37, So, you are a king? And Jesus answered, he said, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Then Pilate said to him, bah, What is truth? <laughs> Classic politician for you there. He doesn't recognize the truth that is Jesus. He doesn't make a decision, ignores him, passes on the decision to the people, and Jesus ends up being crucified. He sees the truth, Jesus tells him the truth, and he ignores it. In John 14, 6 through 7, Jesus says, it says, Jesus says to him, and he was talking to Thomas, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. In other words, in Jesus. So, back to Isaiah. Who is he proclaiming justice to? Well, the Gentiles. The Jews themselves had already received God's word. For centuries, God had worked with them through Moses, through the prophets, through the judges. And here we see that God also speaks to us, the Gentiles. He brings truth and justice to us. Not complaining, not throwing out things that are broken. In this short passage, Matthew reminds us that Jesus is sent by God, is filled with the Holy Spirit, is meek and gentle, he's here for a purpose, and this coming, what we're talking about here in the passage in Matthew, Jesus comes as the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Later on, he'll come as a lion. But right now, the Lamb. In John 1.29, it says, The next day he, in this case, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why did Jesus come? To bring truth and justice, to take away the sin of the world, to be this perfect Lamb of God. What a perfect picture in Isaiah of the Trinity. God the Father speaking about Jesus the Son. The Holy Spirit empowering Jesus. Again, remember that one. And Jesus, in turn, carrying out the work of the Father. In American society, we connect truth and justice, don't we? Truth, justice, in the American way. And the same is true in Scripture. This truth that Jesus was talking about, the reason that he came, he's going to get into it here with the fairies in a few, Pharisees in a few minutes. It's important to us as well. Truth. Back to the live action. Verse 22. Verse 22 says, Then a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw. So, it doesn't really say who brought this person. You kind of have to read the context to figure that out. It's uh, In English, you would call that passive voice. It was brought to him. Uh, but we learned that it was really probably the Pharisees that set this up. And what were they trying to accomplish in this? Why a blind and mute, mute means he couldn't speak, and possessed man to Jesus? And frankly, he probably also couldn't hear. That's how you end up mute. Probably, so he could, Jesus couldn't talk to him. 
couldn't tell him to do something. What was Jesus going to do? It was a test. The Pharisees were testing Jesus. What would he do with this guy? Would he say, stretch forth your hand? Oh, wait. The guy couldn't hear him. Couldn't even see him. Pick up your bed and walk. He couldn't really say that either. The man couldn't hear Jesus tell him those things. Did the man ask Jesus to heal him? Well, no, he really didn't, right? The guy was mute. He couldn't say that. Remember where Jesus heals the leper? He says, the leper says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This guy didn't say that. A dilemma, a test. What will Jesus do? But the verse goes so fast through that. It's like four words. He says, and he healed him. And he healed him. That's all we get. It's like, just like that. Jesus uses this moment to demonstrate his supernatural power. And you know what? We read, we read by it really fast. But the people there, they caught on also really fast. It says in verse 23, And all the people were amazed. I don't want to underemphasize that word. It's like they were knocked off their seats. They were flabbergasted. They couldn't believe it. It was incredible. And that was after Jesus had healed everyone else. This guy was special. This guy was incredible. This guy was different. Why this guy? But it made them think. It made them question. And the rest of verse 23 says, Can this be the son of David? They wonder, who is this? What does it mean? As if all the other signs weren't enough. This one was big. Wasn't Jesus the son of Joseph? What's this son of David thing? Or if you want to be more theological, you know, a son of the Holy Spirit came upon Mary. That's not really what it means here. What is this thing, son of David? Well, we're going to look at a couple passages and we'll read exactly what that means. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 17, it says, when your days are fulfilled, it's talking about King David here, it says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He, and right here in verse 13, it's talking about Solomon, shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son, when he commits iniquity, Solomon. I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. Verse 16, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne, here's the important part, shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision. Nathan spoke to David. That was the prophet Nathan. I rather liked that guy. So this was talking to King David. And interestingly, early in Matthew and the other Gospels, we learn that Jesus is from the house and lineage of David. He is a son, many times removed, of King David. In Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, it says, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Now, Jesse was David's father, same line again, that, end, that, that doesn't end, but it goes through to Jesus. It says, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit, capital S, of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord adds to our case, who is this son of David? In Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 through 6, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The reference to the son of David is a reference to the Messiah. The people were wondering, is this Jesus, the promised Messiah? 
They were trying to make their minds up about him. They weren't fully sure. They were getting to the right answer, but the realization that the people were getting there drove the Pharisees crazy, and they uttered a foolish, thoughtless accusation. Or rather, they revealed the condition of their hearts. They were so intent on interrupting the thought of the people that Jesus could be the Messiah, that they would say anything. Their hearts were already closed. Their decision was already made. The truth to them was irrelevant. In verse 24, it says, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, Ah, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Now, one would think that the Pharisees, by this time, knew better than to challenge Jesus directly. But they were about to get a real poignant lesson here. In a sense, the, the Pharisees were trapped. They had just witnessed a great miracle. The people were amazed. This miracle conclusively demonstrates that Jesus has power over the spirit world and, and over the physical world both. Remember, he healed this guy. He healed him of being deaf. He healed him of being mute. He healed him of being demon-possessed all at once. And the people were amazed. Rightly so. But again, the Pharisees were trapped. In recognizing that Jesus had command over all of these things, they accuse Jesus of being in league with Satan. Beelzebub is a name derived from a Canaanite deity. It literally means Lord of the Flies. And it was how they referred to Satan. And knowing their thoughts, this is verse 25, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Interestingly enough, Jesus performs another miracle. He knows their thoughts. Now, if you look at the scene and from other uh, Gospels, the Pharisees were probably on the outside of this crowd. They're a little ways distant from Jesus, and he calls them in close to him. He reads their minds, and they were apparently working the back of the crowd, trying to shape opinion away from Jesus. But Jesus goes right at them. He confronts them with the foolishness of their argument. His first argument is, Jesus that is, if I, Jesus, were in league with Satan, why would I be busy thwarting Satan's program? It makes no sense. And this was not the first demon that Jesus had cast out. Matthew is full of that. Many, many demons were cast out. Again, getting in the way of Satan's program. It just doesn't make sense. Ultimately, if you were against if Satan were confused and conflicted with himself, it would lead to a collapse of Satan's power. Jesus is saying, in the vernacular here, that's just a dumb idea. You guys had a dumb idea. Verse 27, it says, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. What's Jesus saying here? Jesus brings it a little closer to home. Sons means disciples. Jesus means if your own disciples cast out demons, aren't they getting power from Satan? Like you're accusing me? If so, then they're condemned and you're condemned also because they're your disciples. Or, if they do these things by the power of God, then Jesus is vindicated. Let them judge, he says. They can figure this out. Again, Jesus says, you had a dumb idea here. That was a thoughtless word. Verse 28 says, But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus drives home the message and clearly says that he, Jesus, represents the kingdom of God and not Satan. Verse 29 says, 
Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Jesus is saying, but wait, there's more. Remember, we said that there's a theme throughout this passage. Here again, Jesus is not launching on some separate parable, this parable of the strong man. It's connected. He's speaking to the issue at hand. The strong man in this saying is Satan. Who can enter his house? Who indeed? Who but God can storm the gates of hell? Bind Satan, the strong man, and redeem, carry away his things, redeem the souls of men. Jesus emphatically declares that he, Jesus, is greater than Satan. Verse 30, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus lays out an ultimatum here. If you're not with Jesus, then you're just against him. If you sit on the sidelines, that's not being with Jesus. If you're not actively involved in gathering men to Jesus with him, then you are scattering them. You're not with Jesus then. There are no sidelines with God. No middle ground. There's no independent. There is no one gets to abstain in this question. In this, Jesus performs a grand miracle, causing the Pharisees to react viscerally and reveal their true thoughts. They have made up their minds about Jesus. So opposed to him are they that they cannot accuse him so that they that they instead accuse him of being in league with Satan himself. It is the ultimate rejection of Jesus. It is a rejection not made of ignorance. They clearly knew the scriptures. They were the Pharisees. They were the religious people of the day. They knew them exceedingly well. They knew the prophecies regarding the Messiah. And they had just witnessed many miracles and then a grand miracle. And yet still, willfully, defiantly, spitefully, they reject Jesus and slander him too. In John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, we read, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness, rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The light is Jesus, but their works, Pharisees here, were evil. They rejected Jesus. What does Jesus say to them in light of all of that? We read on in verse 31, Therefore, therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, speaking of Jesus himself, will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. This is perhaps one of the most misunderstood passages in Scripture. But because it is so serious and permanent, we should pay particular attention. We should figure this out. So first we see that every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. So let's define blasphemy. What is that? John MacArthur defines it this way. He says, blasphemy is defiant irreverence, the uniquely terrible sin of intentionally and openly speaking evil against holy God or defaming or mocking him. It's set apart. Every sin and blasphemy as an extra added, extra, even worse, horrible thing. Where have we seen such sin as blasphemy in Scripture? And then there's this difference about speaking blasphemy against the Son of Man, Jesus, versus the Holy Spirit. In 1 Timothy 1.13 we read, and this comes from Paul, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy, because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Paul Speaking here, he's speaking specifically of blaspheming Jesus. And he confesses it, though he did it in ignorance, he says. 
For those still making up their minds about Jesus, the other members of the crowd, that sort of blasphemy was forgivable, Jesus says. Peter, another example, blasphemed Jesus on the night of Jesus' arrest. Yet that was forgiven Peter too. The reality of Jesus, the man and God together, is difficult to grasp. It was difficult for the crowd there. It was difficult for the disciples. It can be difficult for us too. But this was different. This was blasphemy against the Spirit of God. It requires determined unbelief. It is the rejection of God after having seen all the evidence. Salvation is offered to all, but not all will choose it. Some will willfully reject God, and those cannot be forgiven. John MacArthur puts it this way, quote, During Jesus' earthly ministry, the unbelieving Pharisees and all the others who blasphemed the Spirit cut themselves off from God's mercy. Not because it was not offered, but because it was abundantly offered, yet rebelliously and permanently rejected and ridiculed as satanic. Let's not be caught in that. Verse 33 says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Jesus drives home his point here. Either Jesus was a good tree, producing good fruit, or he was a bad tree, producing evil fruit. Sin produces death and disease. Healing, then, is the opposite of that. It's a good thing, a thing from God. Giving life is a good thing, and that comes from God. Satan is evil, but casting out demons is a good thing. Demon possession is evil. Casting out demons is a good thing. A good tree, Jesus says, cannot produce bad fruit. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Or in the vernacular, Jesus is saying, hey, it's time, crowd, to make your mind up about me, about Jesus. In verse 34, he says, You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Jesus then applies this metaphor to the Pharisees. Worse than a bad tree, he calls them a bunch of snakes. Since they are evil, what they speak is evil too. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks is what Jesus says. If your heart is full of good, then it will lead to you speaking good and truthful things. But if your heart is evil... Like the Pharisees here, you will speak foolish and evil things. Before we get to the final conclusion in this passage, let's pause for an application in current happenings. Are you wondering what to think of the current mayhem in our world? Protests in many cities? Anarchy in some? It feels like civil society is in tatters. You can ask the same question that Jesus asked. If a group of protesters on whatever side you care to choose is causing property damage, instilling fear in residents, is screaming hate and anger, is hurting others, even killing them, what kind of fruit is that? Since such fruit is clearly evil, it comes then from an evil tree. The tree is known, again, by its fruit comes from a place of evil. Or if a group is peacefully protesting, if a group is calling for truth and justice, what then? Good fruit indicates a good tree. A tree is known, again, by its, by its fruit. When looking at the news today, ask yourself that question. What fruit is each group producing? I'll leave the rest of that to you. Before we read the kind of Jesus conclusion, which is in, I think, verses 36 and 37, we're going to skip over that, and we'll return to that in a second. We're going to go right to verse 38, where it says, 
Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. I have to pause here. I can't even stand it. Jesus had just healed a whole crowd. And this one guy had amazed the crowd when Jesus healed him, the, the guy who was deaf and mute and blind and demon-possessed all at once. And then they asked for another sign. I can't stand it. What are they trying to do? Oh, we need another sign. They've already revealed their hearts. They've already made up their minds. They've already rejected Jesus. In verse 39, it says, But he answered them, An evil, well, we know that the fruit was evil. He calls them evil. He says, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus is alluding to his own crucifixion, his own death, time spent in the grave, and then resurrection three days later. Verse 41, The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Condemn you, the Pharisees. For they repented Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. What's Jesus saying there? They had Jonah to lead them to the truth, and they repented. You, Pharisees and people of the time, have me, Jesus, here to lead you to the truth. You've rejected me, and yet I am greater than Jonah, says Jesus. Verse 42, the queen of the south, this is the queen of Sheba, will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Same words. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The queen of Sheba had Solomon to lead her to the truth. She believed, and she'll condemn you, Pharisees and people here rejecting me, Jesus, because I'm here to lead you to the truth, the very Son of God. And you've rejected me. This... 38 through 42, it's like, wow, how can they have now asked for another sign? How can they have done that in light of the signs that Jesus had already provided for them? In light of Jesus proving in Scripture, through the prophecies and through his actions and through the Spirit of God being upon him, that he was indeed the Messiah. Here he is standing in front of them and they have rejected him. Horrible place to be. Verse 36. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words will you be justified, and by your words will you be condemned. The Pharisees had just spoken a number of careless words. They had revealed the true nature of their hearts. Their unbelief was plain for all to see. Their rejection of Jesus was complete and utter and absolute. They seek to kill him here from here on out. It's a year, little more than a year before Jesus is crucified, but they've been plotting and planning that the whole time. They have rejected Jesus with their words. Jesus says that people will give an account for every careless word. The Bible tells us that the tongue is a flame it causes all sorts of wildfires. It tells us that the tongue is difficult to bridle or to rein in. It's difficult to control. And it causes all sorts of damage. And really, which of us is innocent of having spoken a careless word? Jesus is reminding us here that we should be exceedingly careful with our words, knowing how they can hurt and defame and even blaspheme. Paul puts it this way in Philippians 2, 14 through 16, where he says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in, in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. We should be careful of our words. Jesus tells us that. Paul tells us to be blameless. 
It's a hard thing to do, but Jesus requires that of us, and it's a part of our testimony in this world, in this word, world. With a blameless spirit, as we're careful with our words, it says in verse 15 that we will shine as lights in the world. And who can argue that we live in a crooked and twisted generation? It's a mess where we live. We should be shining bright in that. In this passage, we saw how Matthew connects Jesus with a powerful messianic prophecy in the book of Isaiah. In this passage, God clearly shows the nature of the Trinity, of Jesus' place in the Trinity, of his mission to bring justice to the world. And that's something that surely seems in short supply, this idea of justice. People call out for justice today, yet seem to disregard the truth in their pursuit. You can't have one without the other. We will never really have justice, indeed, without the truth of Jesus, without Jesus. No program of man, no department, no ministry of this or that in the government, no movement, no law, no guideline. None of that will give us real justice. For that, we, all humanity, needs Jesus. In this passage, we are witnesses to a scene in which the Pharisees seek to test Jesus. A test that Jesus passes spectacularly and uses that test to demonstrate the power of God that is incarnate in him, the Spirit of God. Then Jesus turns the tables on the Pharisees and he tests them and finds them wanting. The Pharisees reveal their true thinking, the fact that they have already rejected Jesus, despite all evidence to the contrary, and claim, the Pharisees claim, that the power used by Jesus comes from Satan. Jesus destroys their arguments, he embarrasses them, leaves them, or rather he leaves us, with two questions today. The Pharisees made their choice. They rejected Jesus. They plotted to destroy him. Here's the two questions. Number one, are you with Jesus? Are you working for him? The good news is that there is still time to come to Jesus. Still time to repent and receive eternal forgiveness. Still time to recognize that Jesus is God and that it is to him that we owe our allegiance. We don't, in the same way, we do not owe allegiance to a nation or to a flag or to a cause or a slogan, but to the God of the universe. If you have not made that decision, if you are sitting on the sidelines and not sure, stop what you're doing right now. Connect with people of God. Call the church leadership right now. Our email is easy. It's genesecountrychurch at gmail.com. The phone is 585-948-9315. Call right now. Someone will answer. Someone will respond to your email. The future is an uncertain place. There is no time to waste. Are you with Jesus? Second question is, we were rem or rather, we were reminded that God will judge our words. What are your words? That's the question. We should be careful not to speak careless words, not to write them on Facebook or Twitter, not to like the foolish words of someone else even. The words condemn us. And at the same time, Jesus says that by our words we can be justified. Romans 10, 9 through 13 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There is no distinction between different races or different cultures, or different income levels. None of that. There's no difference to God. The thing that matters is what we do with Jesus. Because Jesus alone is the source of truth and justice 
for all. Let's close in prayer. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he has come to bring truth and to bring justice to all who would hear and receive him. God, we thank you that there's no distinction there, that we can all receive his salvation. And God, I pray that you would help all of us, each of us, to see that, to embrace it, to repent, and follow after Jesus. God, help us to guard our tongues so that we might not have foolish words spoken. God, help us to guard our thoughts too so that they might not lead to foolish words. Make in our heart goodness that comes only from Jesus so that out of our mouth goodness will flow. And we thank you for that. We praise your name today. And it is the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.